In this video, we're going to talk about the basic building blocks of Bayesian models. It turns out that most Bayesian problems have a similar structure. It is therefore helpful to identify and name these common components such that we can more easily express ourselves. This will also help us to see how we need to address a specific problem at hand. We call these building blocks likelihood, priors, and posteriors. So the general problem formulation is that we are interested in an unknown parameter theta, which is in some parameter space, capital theta, for which we observe some related data y. The type of parameter space that we have will determine the type of problem that we have. This could, for example, be estimation, where theta can take any continuous value, either scalar or a vector, in which case the parameter space, capital theta, is Rn, for example. Or it could be detection, where theta, capital theta, is either minus 1 or 1, indicating uh, if we have detected something or if we have not detected something. A key assumption in all these problems is that we assume that the observed data y is distributed according to this known conditional distribution, where we express the observed data y condition on the parameter of interest, theta. For example, let's say y is an observation from a radar that is measuring the distance to an object, and theta is then the actual distance to the object. So with this model here, we describe the distribution of the radar detection for the case when we know the distance to the object. That is, in the general setting, we are describing how we expect the observation to behave for a situation when we know the actual true value of the parameter of interest, theta. Now this is often far easier than trying to do it the other way around, where we're describing the distribution of theta when we condition on y. And now we know the general problem formulation, so let's look at two of the common components in a Bayesian model likelihood and prior. We start by looking at the likelihood. Since at time of inference our observation y is observed and thus has a fixed value, we often view p of y given theta as a function of the unknown parameter that we're interested in and that is theta. That is, we're typically interested in knowing how likely different values of theta are now that we have observed y. To make it a bit more clear that we view this as a function of theta and not y, it's common that we use this notation instead. So L of theta given y, uh, where L of theta given y is called the likelihood function. So we read this as the likelihood of theta given y. So note that we have switched the order here, so here we have y given theta, but here we have theta given y to emphasize that th we view this as a function of theta and not a function of y. Now, we also often speak of this density as our likelihood, but then we should be clear that we view this as a function of theta and that the likelihood is not a density with respect to theta. For example, if we integrate this over all possible values of theta, in general, this integral would not be 1, which is a requirement for it to be a proper density. The other common component that we have in Bayesian statistics is what we call a prior distribution on theta, which is simply the probability distribution of theta, p of theta, and nothing else. Prior means earlier or before, and p of theta describes what we know before making any observations. So what we know about theta before we do any observations. If we return to our medical example where theta would be the disease of the patient, in this case, the prior would be the distribution of the disease in the general population. That is, how relatively common different diseases are. This information can, for example, help us when the patient's symptoms are vague and can fit many different diseases. So, in a Bayesian setting, this prior information is combined with the likelihood of the different diseases given by our observations to give us what we call the posterior, which we will look at next. One of the main objectives in Bayesian statistics is to compute the posterior, or the posterior density, which in this case we write as p of theta given y. So posterior means after, and p of theta given y describes what we know about theta after observing y. 
That is, it summarizes everything we know about theta after our observation. Now we can compute the posterior using Bayes' rule by rewriting it uh, like this. So p of y given theta times p of theta and divided by p of y. Well, we see that this here is the likelihood, right? And this here is the prior. And the normalization factor here, p of y, is just a constant as we have observed y, we condition on y here, so it's a fixed value, and we're interested in this as a function of theta. So in many cases we ignore this normalization factor here and just write it as proportional to the likelihood times the prior. So let's look at this here using a small toy example where we have a scalar theta and a scalar observation y. Theta could, for example, be the distance to an object, and y could be a measurement of that distance from a radar sensor, for example. So anyway, we have a prior on theta saying that theta should be around 4, and then we have some uncertainty regarding the exact value as indicated by the spread of the prior here. So we have some spread here, which indicate uncertainty in the exact value. Additionally, we get observations on theta saying that uh, theta should be around 6, so the most likely value of theta according to our observation alone is 6, but we also have some uncertainty in our measurement as the likelihood indicates that it's fairly likely that the value is um, between 4 and 8. Now, using Bayes' rule, we can find the posterior distribution of theta given y, that is considering both the prior information that we have about probable values of theta, as well as likely values of theta given by our observation and the resulting likelihood function. And we do this by multiplying the prior with the likelihood and we get this posterior density. However, the posterior density is only proportional to this product. So to get a proper probability density, we need to normalize by this proportionality constant. Now, there are several ways of doing this. For example, as the posterior density is a proper density, we can find a constant such that the integral over this product becomes one over all possible values of theta, because that's a requirement for this to be a proper density. So, to summarize, the posterior is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. So we multiply these two together as a function of theta, and then we get the posterior density. But we need to rescale the posterior density uh, such that it becomes a proper density. So now that we have calculated the posterior density, uh, we can start to answer some interesting questions. So. What is the most probable theta? Well, if we look at the posterior in our example, here we see that the peak of the posterior is around theta equal to 5.2. So this is our most probable value for theta. Now here is a difference between a, what a Bayesian would do and what a frequentist would do. Whereas a Bayesian would be interested in the most probable value of theta, considering both the prior and the likelihood, a frequentist would instead interested in the most likely value of theta as given by the likelihood function. So the most likely value of theta would be around 6. And this is called uh, the maximum likelihood estimate, or MLE, whereas the most probable value after observing y is called the maximum a posteriori estimate, or MAP for short, which is a Bayesian estimate. We might also be interested in what is the probability that theta is in some set A. So let's say that we have some set A here. Now the probability that theta is in this set is simply the integral of the posterior in this region here. So the area under this graph. It's also common that we're interested in knowing the posterior mean of theta, which in our example here is the same as the most probable value of theta. But this is not true in general. In addition to all this, we can also formulate optimal decision problems where we want to minimize our expected cost in a decision theoretic manner. So more on this in a later lecture. Now, let's look at an example where we use all these basic components to calculate the posterior distribution. In this example, we have a scalar parameter theta for which we observe with some additive noise v, where in this case v is zero mean Gaussian with standard deviation sigma. So this means that the likelihood is a Gaussian density in y with mean theta and standard deviation sigma. 
Now, note that there's a slight difference in notation here and here, where here we actually mean the PDF as a function of y, and here we're just saying that v is distributed according to this Gaussian distribution. Now, as you might remember, a Gaussian distribution is proportional to this expression here. So we have e to the power of minus y minus theta squared divided by 2 sigma squared. So to get equality here, there's just this factor, 1 over the square root of 2 pi sigma squared. But as this does not depend on theta, we can ignore it for now. As a prior, we will use what is called a non-informative prior on theta, where p of theta is just proportional to 1, so constant. That is, with this prior, we state that all values of theta are equally probable. We typically use this type of prior when we do not have any good prior information regarding typical values of theta, or when we want to let data have more influence on our knowledge about theta. With the problem setting here, what is the posterior? Well, let's see. So we want to find the posterior, which is p of theta given y. Using Bayes' rule and only considering those factors that depend on theta, we can rewrite this as proportional to p of y given theta times p of theta. So here we have the likelihood times the prior. Now, if we insert our expression for the likelihood and the prior, we get Now, if we look at this expression here, we see that it's actually proportional to a Gaussian density, which is Gaussian density of theta with parameters with mean y and standard deviation sigma squared. So, we have that our posterior density is proportional to this Gaussian density here. Now, as our posterior density has to be a proper density of theta, by definition, these two must be equal. That is, if we try to find a proportionality constant, which makes this equality, the proportionality constant will be 1. So, to conclude, p, our posterior, p of theta given y, is in this case equal to this Gaussian distribution theta uh, with mean y and variance, sigma squared. So one can note that with this non-informative prior, our posterior density has the same shape as our likelihood. Intuitively, this makes sense as the only information that we have about theta comes from the likelihood. So we would not be able to do any better than uh, the likelihood in this case. So if we try to illustrate this posterior, we have the posterior of um, theta given y, and this is a function of theta, we see that the mean of this is at our observation y, so we have a Gaussian around y, where the spread of this Gaussian is given by the variance sigma squared. So what we basically had in our small example that we just did was a Bayesian measurement update using an observation from a single sensor. Now, suppose that we collect measurements from two types of sensors, let's call them Y1 and Y2. This could, for example, be both from a radar sensor and a camera, for example, that are independently measuring the relative distance to this vehicle here. Now, naturally, we would like to use both of these observations to get a better understanding of the relative position to this vehicle. That is, we want to fuse the information from these sensors. Now, how would we go about doing this in a Bayesian setting? Well, as always, we seek to calculate the posterior distribution of theta given our observations. Now, instead of just having a single observation, we instead have two observations, one from the radar, and one from the camera. Now, if we apply Bayes' rule to this expression uh, and ignoring the proportionality constant, we can still decompose it as a prior times a likelihood. 
but where the likelihood now depends on both our observations. So in principle, there is no difference between fusing observations from two or more sensors and just making a measurement update from a single sensor. We might as well call Y1 and Y2 as our single observation, Y, which is now then a vector, and we end up with the same general expression as we had before, right? So how do we handle this joint likelihood here? Well, it's often reasonable to assume that y1 and y2 are conditionally independent if we know theta. So in this example here, if we actually know the distance to this vehicle here, also knowing the noisy distance from the camera will not help us describing the measurements from the radar and vice versa. So if this is the case, we can decompose this joint likelihood condition on theta as two separate single sensor likelihoods, one for each sensor. I would encourage you to figure out how you would do the measurement update in this case, where you have two conditionally independent observations on theta. So you have a likelihood looking like this. We end this video with a self-assessment question for you to think about.